Well, good morning. How are we doing? Good. Hey, my name is Alex, and I'm one of the pastors here at Fellowship Bible, and we are glad that you're here today, especially if you're visiting with us uh, on this Sunday. Uh, I would just tell you a little bit about who we are. Our mission is we are a people who exist to worship God, uh, to share Jesus Christ, and build believers, and that's what we're all about. So everything we do around here uh, flows from that, including WOW Weekend. And for those of you who are new, because I'm new as well, uh, you don't even know what WOW means. So WOW stands for World Outreach Weekend. So now you're clued in a little bit uh, into what that means. It's all about uh, missions and what an incredible history and legacy that our church has uh, in this area of missions over 40 plus years of ministry. The fact that we give somewhere in the neighborhood of $170,000 a year uh, in support of our missionaries. So phenomenal, phenomenal part of our uh, DNA. So we uh, do look forward to that weekend and hope that you will participate as much as your schedule allows. And uh, as Chuck said, thank you for giving because uh, when you give, you're helping support uh, the gospel, uh, meeting needs of people all around the world. Um, also, I need to give just a, a little brief PG-13 warning this morning. I always like to do that when we get to uh, difficult parts of the Bible, things that, that we need to talk about, understanding that we have little ears uh, in the room. And so we're, we're going to talk a little bit about lust and pornography uh, today. Not a lot, but a little bit because it's uh, in our text today. And, uh, and so I always like to say that it, now would be a great time if you don't want your kids to hear about that this morning to excuse yourself and take them over to FBC uh, kids. So let me begin today with a rhetorical question. <clears throat> Have you ever noticed that we as human beings are experts at justifying ourselves and our behaviors? That we have this unique ability to um, convince ourselves that no matter what we've done, um, that, you know what, we're okay. I mean, you know, it's, gonna, it's all good. I mean, at the end of the day, right? Think about it. How many times have you heard, well, it wasn't the best choice that I could have made, but it's going to be okay. Or, um, yes, I know I shouldn't have done that, but it's okay. It's not like I do that thing all the time. It's not like I act like that uh, always and, and all the time. It, I mean, we do that kind of stuff, don't we? But, but here's the truth. When we make excuses or justify our behavior, what we're really doing is failing to recognize that we are not measuring up to someone else's standard. Let me give you some examples. Um, when you fail the test, students, this will be a tough one to hear, but when you fail the test, face it, you likely didn't study hard enough or long enough or know the material as well as you should have. Um, adults, when you maybe get passed over for the job or the promotion, face it, it's possible that someone else would just was the better candidate than you, um, or, you know, deserve to get that position, or uh, just had, you know, more skills or whatever. When you get denied the loan for the house or the car, perhaps it's really due because you have bad credit, and the lender just doesn't think that you're, you know, worth the risk or worth get loaning the money out to. It's like when these things happen to us, when we're confronted with this reality, sometimes it's just too painful to deal with, and so we justify ourselves and we make excuses, and so we say things like this. Students, you say this all the time. Well, you know, the teacher, the professor, they didn't really cover that material. <clears throat> they, they asked all the wrong questions, at least not the ones that I studied for. Anyway, that's not really fair, you know, or, um, you know, we may say things like, you know, I can't believe she got promoted. You know, I've worked here longer uh, than she has, and, and so I should, you know, have the seniority here. I believe that one of the major problems with today's postmodern mindset is that people have lost their desire to appeal to a standard outside of themselves when it comes to their behavior. Um, so what we do is <clears throat> we make up our own standard. 
and we set our own bar, and then we compare ourselves to it, and surprise, we measure up. And so today, as we continue working our way through the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus is going to confront those of us who would say, you know what, it doesn't really matter if I fudge on my taxes a little bit, or it doesn't really matter if I'm fantasizing about someone else, you know, sexually, that's not my spouse, it's not like I'm committing adultery. And then on the flip side of that, he's also going to confront those of us who take pride in our religious activity and our religious service. Those of us who would say, well, at least I'm not like those people, you know, I'm living up to God's standard. And so if you have your Bible, I want to invite you to turn with me to Matthew chapter 5. We've just been working our way through these three chapters that referred to as the Sermon on the Mount. And this morning, what we're going to see is Jesus focus his divine, divine spotlight, um, not just on our behavior, but on our hearts. And so we're going to pick it up in verse 17. This is where we left off in verse 16 last week. So beginning in verse 17, Jesus says, Do not think that I've come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. For truly, I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not an iota, not a dot will pass from the law until all is accomplished. Therefore, whoever relaxes one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever does them and teaches them will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I tell you, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Okay, so let's just remember a little bit of the scene that's at the beginning of chapter 5. Uh, Jesus is on a hillside, on a mountainside. He's teaching. It tells us not the crowds. Crowds had been following him. But it says he pauses for a moment, sits down on a hillside, and begins to teach his disciples. And if you remember from week one, we don't know exactly how many disciples that was. Um, Oftentimes in our thinking, we think it was probably the 12 that are often referred to. But as we said in week one, at this point in his gospel, Matthew um, hasn't even gotten to that point yet where Jesus has uh, picked or chosen the 12. And and so again, he's, he's just teaching people. He's teaching these disciples, people who sought to learn from him. And so how many were there? We don't know exactly, probably dozens. And after teaching them, In the opening of his sermon and his message, he teaches them some characteristics of what it looks like to live a kingdom-centered life. We call that uh, the Beatitudes. He then covers what we talked about last week, is what does it mean for us to go out into the world and be salt and light? And after he teaches these things, he continues now by saying, well, he came to fulfill the law. And so a couple of things to note here. First, you should know this. When Jesus says the law and the prophets, he's actually referring to the Old Testament, what you and I would call the Old Testament. Um, the Jewish people during that day, they, if you had said Old Testament to them, they would have said, what are you talking about? Um, they didn't have an Old Testament, right? They had the law and the prophets. And so that's what Jesus means here. And there's been a lot of debate on what Jesus meant when he said that he came to fulfill the law and the prophets or that he came to fulfill the Old Testament. I mean, the first question that you got to ask is, well, was Jesus referring to himself? Like, like the person, was he referring to himself when he said he came to fulfill the Old Testament or was he referring to his teaching? You know, wh- which... Which was it? Did he fulfill the law himself, or or did his teaching fulfill it? I love what Thomas Constable says about this. He says, since the contrast, as we see there in verse 17, is to abolish the law, it seems probable that Jesus meant that his teaching fulfilled the law. He did not intend that what he taught the people would replace the teaching of the Old Testament, but that it would fulfill it or establish it completely. So probably, as Jesus is teaching them, he means that he came to fulfill or establish the Old Testament, the law and the prophets, fully. To add his 
authoritative approval to it. He wanted these disciples to understand that what he was teaching them in no way contradicted what they already knew. It didn't contradict the law and the prophets. It didn't contradict the Old Testament. And it was important for him to say this at this point in the sermon because he then proceeds to contrast the teaching of the scribes and the Pharisees with the true meaning of the Old Testament. And then what follows after Jesus um, talks about the Old Testament here, the law and the prophets, what follows are these verses about the law and the changing of the standard, and, and he does six comparisons between the external performance of the law and the internal obedience to the law. Jesus uses six comparisons. He, he talks about anger, lust, divorce, swearing of oaths, revenge, and hatred. And in each case, he calls us, his followers, to commit ourselves um, not just to obeying the external circumstances of the law, but also making sure that we've addressed the internal issues of the heart. And so we're going to cover the first four uh, this morning. So just put your seatbelt on. We're going to fly through this real quick. We're going to talk about anger, lust, divorce, and swearing of oaths. So look at verse 21. He says, you have heard that it was said to those of old. And so let me just pause. Remember, Jesus has just said he came to fulfill the law uh, and the prophets, the Old Testament. So what he's about to do here with each one of these issues, he's going to say, well, you've heard it said. In other words, you guys know what the law and prophets say. To us, it would, you guys know what the Old Testament says. And then he's going to say, but I say. So, so he's going to kind of up it a little bit. So he says, you've heard that it was said to those of old, you shall not murder, and whoever murders will be liable to judgment. But I say to you that everyone who is angry with his brother will be liable to judgment. Whoever insults his brother will be liable to the council. And whoever says you fool will be liable to the hell of fire. So I want to pause right there, and, and I want to show you how desperately God loves you and is for you. He just said, Jesus just said, hey, listen, you've heard it said, you know this is true, that if you murder someone, you're going to be liable for that, that you're going to be judged. But I say to you that if you're angry in your heart, you're going to be liable also. And you're like, well, how does that make God loving? Because God is saying, hey, if you murder someone, of course you're going to be judged. I mean, I think we all know that. Like, you took someone's life, you're going to be judged. He's like, I would just rather you have the freedom of heart to not get angry. To not walk in the kind of anger that would cause you to want to murder somebody. To just like avoid that part of the process. I mean, Jesus is serious about anger. And, and, and there's two things that stand out to me when I look at the rest of scripture about why God is so serious about angry hearts. Um, first, to allow anger to grow and fester in your heart is to give the enemy a foothold, right? We know this from Ephesians. Ephesians 4 says, be angry and do not sin and do not let the sun go down on your anger and give no opportunity to the devil, right? So if you just track through the scriptures, what we know is that we have an enemy and our enemy um, is, is called the father of lies. And what Satan and his minions or demons excel at is the art of lying and have us, having us believe that those lies are true. To not be serious about anger in our hearts, then, is to give the enemy a foothold in our lives. And when we do that, it causes a ton of problems for us, right? Here's another reason um, why anger is so serious. Not only do angerness and bitterness and resentment give the devil a foothold, but they also have the ability to destroy you and to destroy those around you. Look at what the writer of Hebrews says. He says, strive for peace with everyone and for the holiness without which no one will see the Lord. See to it that no one fails to obtain the grace of God, that no root of bitterness springs up and causes trouble, and by it many become defiled. 
And so the writer here uses an analogy, and what's interesting about this analogy is, is this roots are under the surface, right? Um, and, and so when he's saying root of bitterness, he's referring to, or he's referencing not what's visible, not what you can see, he's referencing what's invisible, what you can't say. He's saying, hey, be careful of that root, what's on the inside, what's in the heart. And so Jesus wants us to respond to anger in a very particular way. Look at what he says in verse 23. He starts with the word so. So is a great word. In fact, I use that word all the time. I mean, if you were to go back and listen to uh, my sermons, it, it's probably the word that I say the most from week to week. So, and the reason that I say that and the reason that Jesus used that is that he makes a point and then he uses the word so because he's trying to connect it to what he just said. So he's just talked about anger and, and not being angry and don't let your anger boil up. And then he, he says, so, if you're offering your gift at the altar and there remember that your brother or sister has something against you, leave your gift there before the altar and go. First, be reconciled to your brother, and then come and offer your gift. Now, for those of you who are paying attention, do you see what Jesus just did there? The first couple of verses is he's talking about anger. He's talking about your anger. He's talking about your anger and your angry heart and why it's destructive to you. And now he's flipped this thing on its head and he's talking about how we interact with one another at church in a community of faith with our fellow brothers and sisters. And if you don't know who that is, just look to your left or your right or behind you in front of you. He says, if you come into the house of God and there at the house of God, you remember that your brother has something against you, right? So in Jesus' scenario, are you the one that's angry? Somebody can answer that. No, right? You're not the one that's angry. Somebody's angry at you. And so Jesus is so serious about how we interact with one another. He's saying, if you come to Fellowship Bible, if you came in here this morning, you came to worship me at church, and when you got here, you remembered that somebody else was mad at you, he tells you to push pause. He's like, push pause on your worship, and go find that person, and reconcile yourself to them. Go and make things right. And then look how he ends at verse 25. He says, come to terms quickly with your accuser while you're going with him to court, lest your accuser hand you over to the judge and the judge to the guard and you be put in prison. Truly I say to you, you will never get out until you've paid the last penny. Again, Jesus is just not letting up the pressure here, right? Just not letting up the pressure on us to quickly go to, the, to those who we've offended or have offended us and, and make things right. He's saying, don't let it get to this massive point. Don't let it get to the point where your heart explodes externally, and now what you want to do is you just want to murder him. Don't do that. Then Jesus moves on from anger by addressing the issue of lust and its impact on our hearts. Look at verse 27. He says, you've heard that it was said, you shall not commit adultery. But I say to you that everyone who looks at a woman with lustful intent has already committed adultery with her in his heart. So let's just talk about this for a minute. Let's chat about what it means to look upon a woman, uh, to look upon the opposite sex, really. Although this is addressing men, and, and we would say that this is primarily or predominantly a, a male issue, we know that this cuts both ways. And so what it means to look upon a woman with lustful intent or to look upon a man with lustful intent is that you want from them something that you are not in covenant with them to get. In other words, you want to take what is not yours. That, that, that's a better way of saying it. That's what lust is. You, you want to take something that doesn't belong to you. 
That's like stealing. I mean, I could preach an entire sermon on this, but let me just give you two primary reasons why this is so corrosive, okay? Pornography and fantasy, and this is how I think this primarily plays itself out in our society today is through pornography and fantasy. They're, they're devastating because they, one, here's the first thing, they dehumanize their object. When God gave us the gift of sex, the physical act of the external, he also gave us, along with that, the gift of intimacy that's wrapped up in the internal, which is in our soul. And so my wife, she is more than just a body. She is a physical body who has a soul. She is... um, more than that. Your spouse is more than just a a physical body. They have emotion. They have feelings. They have a heart. They have desires. And so to simply want from them just a a physical act is to dehumanize them. It's, It's like you're using them for your own good with no real end in mind. You don't really care for them. There's no real commitment there to their spiritual state or to their emotion. It's dehumanizing. Here's the second thing about pornography and fantasy. And I say pornography and fantasy primarily because men, we are driven to the pornography, to the visual. Uh, Ladies, uh, you read fantasy fiction, many of you. I mean, we just know that that's the case. It rewires the brain. William Struthers is a biopsychologist, and he rolled out a ton of information about what pornography and fantasy and living in fantasy does to us, and it it, it, it rewires the neural pathways uh, in our brain. It's like, and sometimes it creates new neural pathways. So, like, if you desire the rush of the sexual experience, that dopamine, and, and you desire that release of the sexual experience, and then you train yourself that the way that that works is via pornography or via fantasy, uh, your brain picks up on that, and it creates these new neural, pa- neural pathways, and well, that's now the, the avenue that you have to go down to to get that dopamine rush, to get that release. In fact, in some cases, the brain rewires itself so much that you would rather have the pornography or the fantasy than the real thing. And so look at what Jesus says next. Since what God wants is your fullness and gladness of your heart, and since God created the opposite sex and created for us the gift of sex, you'll see how serious he is. He says this in verse 29. If your right eye causes you to sin, remember he's talking about lust. If your right eye causes you to sin, tear it out and throw it away. For it's better that you lose one of your members than that your whole body be thrown into hell. Now, before everybody comes back next week looking like a pirate, let's talk about this. He continues, and if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. For it's better that you lose one of your members than your whole body go into hell. What Jesus is saying, he's saying, listen, this is, I'm so serious about this. Like, this is so toxic for you and your soul. This is so dangerous for your heart that you'd better be serious about what I just said. That's why he's giving these examples of plucking out your eye and cutting off your hand. I don't think he means for you to do that. He's using those metaphors to say, you you wouldn't want to poke your eye out, right? You wouldn't want to chop your hand off, right? I'm serious about this. I'm so serious about how corrosive lust is going to be to your joy, your ability to connect with another person, and, and I want you to feel intimacy the way that I created you to feel intimacy. And, and so he's like, man, you, you just better be serious about the life of your mind, about the intent of your eyes, 
about where you glance, about how long you glance, about whether you take a second look, where you go, where you dwell. Like, think about these things. Take care of your mind. Jesus is just not letting up the pressure here as he's teaching, is he? And then after addressing the issues of anger and lust, Jesus tackles the issue of divorce, and now it gets really hard. He says in verse 31, it was also said, whoever divorces his wife, let him give her a certificate of divorce. But I say to you that everyone who divorces his wife, except on the ground of sexual immorality, makes her commit adultery, and whoever marries a divorced woman commits adultery. See what I mean? I mean, right now, don't you want me to step in here and tell you why that doesn't mean what it says it means? I can't. He wants it to feel impossible. I, I, I think that's what Jesus wants. I think, the, like the Bible on this topic, I, I think God wants this to feel impossible. And, and let me explain why. You see, Jesus preaches this Sermon on the Mount, and then later on in Matthew chapter 19, a group of Pharisees walk up to Jesus, and one of them asks the question, um, is there any reason um, that, that we can divorce uh, our spouse, our wife? Now, isn't that a terrible question? It's like the guy saying, I, I want to be godly, I, I I want to look godly, so give me a godly reason to dump this woman. And that's what he's asking Jesus. That's the question. How do I get out of this marriage? And Jesus responds with a long bit of scripture, some of which you typically hear in in wedding vows. He he says, what therefore God has joined together, let no man separate. That's Jesus' response to the question. But then the Pharisees, like, come back to it. They're experts in the law, right? And so they're like, well, if that's true, if you're not supposed to be divorced, then why did Moses allow us to give a certificate of divorce? And Jesus, I mean, just listen to this. This is his answer. He says, because of your hardness of heart, Moses allowed you to divorce. And Jesus brings it back to the heart. Moses gave you that because you guys are hard of heart. And then he says, but from the beginning, it was not so. I mean, if you were here for our Genesis series, right, you, you know that's God's design for marriage, that God's plan would, would be that two, one man, one woman, would become one flesh, and that would create an unbreakable bond, like a ferocious commitment to one another that's going to mirror God's covenant that he made with his people. And so he's going to the real issue here about divorce, I think, starting in verse 33. Even though the the subject here changes to oaths, I think he's just kind of continuing this teaching on divorce. And here's what he says. He's going after our hearts here in verse 33. He says, again, you've heard that it was said to those of old, you shall not swear falsely, but shall perform to the Lord what you've sworn. Okay, so what this is referencing, it's referencing an Old Testament law that said, hey, don't make promises to God and not keep them. Um, like you swear to God in the Old Testament and you don't follow through on that, they'll kill you. And then in verse 34, he says, but I say to you, don't take an oath at all. I mean, much less by God. He's like, don't take an oath at all, either by heaven, for it is the throne of God, or by the earth, for it is his footstool, or by Jerusalem, for it's the city of the great king. And you're like, what's he talking about here? Well, in essence, what Jesus is saying is, hey, let's not play games. I mean, what they were doing is they were trying to find these little loopholes and say, well, if I swear by the city of Jerusalem and Or if I, you know, swear by these other things, then it's not swearing by God. And Jesus is like, nope. It doesn't matter if you, like, make a a promise on your mother's grave. You're making an oath to God. 
That if you make any kind of promise, it doesn't matter what you're making it to or with whom, you're making an oath to God. And so he says in verse 36, And do not take an oath by your head, for you cannot make one hair white or black. Let what you say be simply yes or no, anything more than this comes from evil. And so why we just say yes or why we just say no is because to promise more than that, to swear more than that would be a promise to God whether we like it or not. If we try to promise by our own power and authority, we're promising by something that's just hopelessly fragile. And so as we draw to a close here, my question for you is, where is Jesus confronting you? I mean, as we read this text this morning, like, where did you shift in your chair <laughs> a little bit? Like, what made you feel uncomfortable? What gave you pause? You're like, hmm, I don't know. Where do you, maybe ask yourself this question, where are you, like, sincerely right now, wanting to avoid the teaching of Jesus? Is it in anger? Is it in lust? Is it dishonesty? Is it hatred? I mean, will, will you just do this for me? Whatever it is that came to your mind this morning, would you just meet Jesus there in that spot, in that place? Will you ask him, like the disciples that were following him around, would you say, would you be my rabbi? Here, would you be my teacher? W would you help me? I mean, friends, he confronts you, but he also forgives you if you ask. There's no condemnation for those who are in Christ. But he wants to transform you. Would you bow your heads and close your eyes with me for just a moment? Would you ask him in this moment by the power of the Holy Spirit to just transform your heart from following an external standard of the law to, to following the internal standard of the heart of Jesus? And as we pray here in just a minute, I just want you to consider again this morning where Jesus is confronting you. And be reminded that that's where he wants to forgive you. And it's in that place that he wants to transform you. Because that's what he does. And this was a difficult message to prepare for, to preach, and to listen to, quite honestly. But if you're sitting here feeling beat up, feeling guilty for your behavior, your inability to measure up to the standard, then you've missed the point. God's standard, God's word, God's law, the Bible is impossible to live up to without Jesus. And the point is, is that Jesus cares about you and I deeply. And as we learned this morning, he cares way more about our heart than our behavior. He cares about our behavior. He cares about our hearts. He cares about who you're becoming on the inside. More so than what you do on the outside. Because if you'll focus on the heart and on the inside, then that outward behavior is going to take care of itself. And so let's pray. Heavenly Father, we, um, we do love you, and uh, we come humbly before you this morning after talking about some very uh, difficult subjects that Jesus taught his disciples. 
And every one of us in this room have struggled with those moments where, God, we just feel like we don't measure up. We just, we don't measure up to the standard. And my prayer this morning is, rather than um, having a heart or a mind that would want to justify our behavior, is that you would take hold of our hearts today. that we would turn our hearts and our minds uh, over to you today. Ultimately, that's, that's what you're after. You're not after our best behavior, you're after our heart. And so, Father, I, I pray for those of us who are here that already are experiencing a personal relationship with Jesus Christ, that if there are areas that we need to deal with you this morning, um, that we would do that. That if we're angry, that we would let that go. If we're dealing with lust or pornography or whatever it is, Father, today would be the day that we would let those things go. That we would take back our mind. If we're struggling in our relationship with our spouse, that, that you get a hold of our hearts. And if there's someone here today that hasn't yet stepped into a relationship with Jesus Christ, I, I pray uh, that you um, would just give your heart and your mind and your life over to Jesus today. There's no better relationship of this side of heaven that you could have than a personal relationship with our Lord and Savior. And so if that's you and you're here today and you want to know more about that, would you just come find me uh, after the service? I'll be out there in the lobby. Maybe someone who's on our church staff, one of our elders. We'd just love to tell you more about what it means to have a personal relationship with he who cares about our hearts. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Um, hey, just a couple of announcements um, for us before we get out of here. Next week, our pastor, our associate pastor of ministries candidate uh, will be here. Uh, elders are meeting tonight uh, to just kind of finalize that whole weekend. And so look, uh, for an email either later tonight or sometime tomorrow with some more information about our candidate and about uh, next weekend and what that's going to look like. Uh, we'll send out a resume and, and questionnaire, I'm sure, and, and some other stuff. So look for that uh, tomorrow. And then be here next week as our candidate will be here to speak and to preach and tell a little bit uh, about his story. Um, also, we have a congregational meeting next Sunday at... 3.30, in which we're going to um, ordain our new deacons and elders. They actually started their service January 1st when we turned over the calendar, um, but we'll do the official ordination and uh, laying on of hands and branding and tattoos and secret handshakes and all that <laughs> next I don't know. I haven't been here. I don't know what we do. Um, and so we'll do that next Sunday uh, at 3.30. And I feel like there's one other thing that I'm supposed to tell you, but apparently it's not important. <clears throat> Glad you were here today. Would you? <laughs> I thought if I didn't stall for a second, oh, that's what, hey, thank you for putting that up. If you're here and you would like to pray with somebody, this, is, this might be the most important part of the day. Sincerely, if you're here and God's just doing business with you, if the Holy Spirit's just getting hold of your life, this morning, and you want to pray with someone, there'll be some people uh, down here that would love nothing more than to pray with you. And so as we stand, uh, if you're on our prayer team, would you come forward, just come down front and uh, come seek out some prayer. Let's read our benediction together. These words will be on the screen. Father, help us to live this week to the full, being true to you in every way. being kind to everyone we meet. Holy Spirit, 
Help us to love the lost, proclaiming Christ in all we do and say. Amen.